Hello and welcome back. This video will discuss end of arm tooling for robotics. So when most people talk about end of arm tooling for a robot, the normal thing that comes to most people's mind, I believe, are grippers. And there are a number of options available to the integrator. You can do pneumatic grippers, hydraulic grippers, vacuum grippers, electromechanical grippers that involve solenoids, servos, steppers, things like that. And then there are different motions that the grippers can take. Parallel gripping, angular gripping are the two common ones, but there are others out there. From a personal point of view, I tend to like sticking with pneumatic grippers. There are the advantages of cost. You don't have to worry about hydraulic oil leaking or lines rupturing. If a pneumatic line ruptures, it makes a lot of noise and blows a lot of air. If a hydraulic line lets go, there is oil everywhere. And because it's under significantly higher pressure, there's actually uh, danger to, the, to any workers in the area. Vacuum grippers are extremely common and have a set of challenges all their own. The biggest problem is actually not creating the vacuum generally, but I think for the uninitiated or the less experienced, it's turning the vacuum on and off. If you need a lot of vacuum, a new student will often try to switch that vacuum line on and off with a standard valve. Uh, unfortunately, you have to have a valve that is specifically designed for vacuum. I mentioned the different motions on the left, you can see what I mean by parallel versus angular. A is parallel, C is angular. There are advantages and disadvantages to each of those. And it really comes down to what are you trying to pick up? If you are trying to pick up spherical and or round objects, uh, quite often I found the angular grippers work better. The problem with the angular gripper is you sometimes need more space because of that angle. Uh, the spacing between the products, both at the point of pickup and the point of drop-off, start to become extremely critical. The middle gripper is a three-jaw gripper, and it will come in from all three sides. You can have four, five, six, however many jaws you really want that are all moving at the same time and are closing on the item in the middle simultaneously. You don't always have to use a three or more jaw gripper, you can get away with parallel grippers or even angular grippers, but you do have to make sure the face of the gripper is designed to trap what you are trying to grab and not letting it slide or shoot out from one side or the other. Uh, more often than not, the three jaw grippers are used for cylindrical parts, but you can use parallel or angular grippers on those as well. You just have to make sure there is some sort of a notch or a V groove built into the face of the gripper to ensure that you are centering the part and capturing it at a repeatable location. So this gripper here is an angular gripper and happens to be pneumatically driven. And so you can see the little, the piston and the little air cylinder down here, and it drives a rod up that's pinned to the two jaws. And as this goes up, the jaws will angle out this gripper on the left is designed for clamping. And so there's an air cylinder in here that moves in and out that will pivot this outer arm of the gripper up. And when it comes down and grabs something, it will clamp the part in between the two jaws here. This might be useful for something like sheet metal where you're trying to hold two parts together. One of the more unusual looking grippers that you may run across are internal hole grippers here. And what this has, these black dots are pads of some sort that, that when the gripper is in its relaxed state, the pads are flush with the cylinder. And when you apply pressure to the gripper or you activate the gripper, the pads come out and they will come out a designated amount and grab the internal diameter of a hole or a bore or a cylinder or something like that. The following videos have been selected to give you an idea of some of the types of solutions that exist for end of arm tooling.
Our first example is picking up these tubes, which are corner supports for the cardboard box. It will apply adhesive to the tubes and then place them in the box. As you can see, the gripper has been designed specifically to support the entire tube. And this application is for applying sealant to these parts. As you can see, it is laying a consistent thin bead along the edge of the plastic part. And in this example, they are lifting bags of rice, but the gripper has also been designed, as you'll see in a moment, to be able to also lift up the sheets of cardboard that separate the rice bag layers. Soft robot, by definition, is a robot made of things that are not rigid or not hard. We make robotic actuators out of rubber materials. No sensors, no tendons, no pulleys, no rigid joints. If you think about if you were going to build a robotic octopus, what would it look like? That was the inspiration for our technology. Can you break down the technology on a really basic level as far as um, you know the, the inflation, how it actually works? Great. So it, it basically, we take elastomeric material, so rubber, build a number of fluidic channels into it, layer it with composites, so other materials of other stiffness, and then by controlling the pressurization, the rate of pressurization, you get bending or extension or actuating. And so if you think about inflating a balloon, it inflates outwardly with a soft robotic actuator because you've built these layered composites and you've channeled the air in a certain way, you can get this gripping action instead of just an inflation, you get actuation. So as you're watching these next examples, pay attention to how the item that is being manipulated is being supported potentially along multiple surfaces.
Kuka. In this processing video, I want you to make note that the robot has moved the tool to the part. In this video, you will note the part is being moved to the tool. So what I'm hoping you got out of this series of video clips is the realization that there is almost nothing that you cannot have the robot do. Some of the things you will want to make sure you're paying attention to, whether you are selecting an off-the-shelf gripper or you are designing a custom gripper, you're going to want to pay a lot of attention to the weight of the part to make sure that the gripper is beefy enough and robust enough to support the part as it's being moved. At the same time, you're going to have to pay attention to how rigid or fragile is the part. If I'm grabbing light bulbs, I'm going to have to be extremely careful that I don't crush them. But at the same time, if I'm picking up bags of rice or I'm picking up bags of rock salt, I have an item that is extremely flexible and I need to make sure that I support it sufficiently. You want to pay attention to the surface finish of the part. If it is a highly polished surface, you're going to need to make sure that you are not marring that surface. If it is an extremely porous surface, vacuum grippers may not be sufficient. You will also have to keep in mind how are you getting input and output signals to the gripper? How are you getting power to the gripper? Does it need air because it's pneumatic? If so, how are you getting the air to the gripper? Is it external hoses? Are you running the hoses through the robot and using robot inputs and outputs? Is it hydraulic? How are you going to run the hydraulic lines? Where are they going to be attached to the robot? How are you going to make sure that they don't get pinched, they don't get torn, stretched, or otherwise damaged? Because as I mentioned already, hydraulic oil is extremely messy and has the risk of being extremely dangerous. Tool changers are a way for the robot to be more flexible. And so this next video will show one brand of tool changer that I'm aware of. There are others. There are a lot of others out there in reality. 
Uh, this just happens to be a decent video that shows how their tool changer works in addition to some applications and an interesting range of sizes of robots and parts that are having to be manipulated. Putting a robot in a customer's facility is a big commitment. ATI tool changers allow us to utilize more processes and more tools on a single robot. A robotic tool changer is a coupling device. It locks and unlocks pneumatically and allows your robot to pick up and drop off different tools or different end effectors, and it'll pass those different utilities through that tool changer. If you use a tool changer, you can be welding with it for a while, then material handling, or material handling and then inspection, material removal, all kinds of processes with a single arm. The tool changer consists of a master plate which is connected to the robot and a tool plate which is connected to the tooling. Coupling is achieved through a patented, precision, high-strength stainless steel locking mechanism. When it's time to do a tool change, the robot brings the master close, but does not touch the tool. The locking mechanism is engaged. This allows ATI's patented no-touch locking technology to pull the tool up out of the tool stand to a locked position. Robots are extremely powerful tools. The key is, is that the tool changer, since it's stronger than a robot, is always going to perform well because the robot cannot exceed the specifications of the tool changer. It's not capable. When we turn off that robot and that one ton pipe is suspended in air, I want to make sure that it's going to stay on there. And with ATI, that's the least of my worries. When the master and tool are within the ready-to-lock distance, a pneumatically actuated piston drives the multi-tapered cam into contact with the locking balls. The first taper of the cam forces the locking balls outward and into contact with the bearing race, thus pulling the tool up toward the master. The second taper of the cam forces the locking balls further out and under the bearing race, pulling the tool into a high-strength locked position. This will securely couple the master to the tool, providing a high load carrying capacity. The fail-safe feature prevents the master from releasing the tool if lock air pressure is accidentally removed. The reverse taper of the cam, which is between the first and second taper, prevents the locking balls on the master from moving, keeping the tool secure to the master, even due to gravity, vibration, or acceleration. ATI's fail-safe design eliminates the potential problems of a spring-based fail-safe. And just like with the design of the gripper, the tool changer has to consider the weight of the quick change hardware as well as the weight of the part and the combination of those had better be less than the max payload for the robot. As you select a tool changer, you will want to make sure that you are taking into account the gripper requirements, the tooling requirements. If, they're, if the end of arm tooling is a high powered motor for a machining process, you're gonna to need to make sure that the tool changer is able to switch and connect that higher amperage signal, or you will run the risk of having the motor burn out components within the tool changer, or even potentially the robot. You will wanna pay attention to the speed required of the overall process, because if the tool changer requires an extremely slow speed, you may need to consider a different style of tool changer. All right, hopefully this has made some sense and has helped you to better understand some of the challenges and questions that surround the selection and design of end-of-arm tooling for a robot. That's all for now. Thanks.